much. Thank you. Thank you for, for the extensive introduction, although I would make it shorter, <laughs> but it's okay. So I, what I will present today and what I would like to talk today is actually part of my ongoing book project. Uh, hopefully uh, it's coming to an end. Uh, related to, to singing activism to activist choirs in the era of former Yugoslavia. And basically I made this title very long, but it could be just like leftovers. <laughs> it can be very, very simple. Maybe under this, this term, having left in capital uh, letters and overs and small letters, what we can, how we can learn and what we can learn and how we can, we can recuperate some experiences we had we had in the in the past so i will i will start with um short music music example if rasika you can share with us on the screen that we contextualize that i contextualize yes, what I, can... I want to talk about yes i'm just gonna do it now in a second just tell me if you can hear this okay Thank you, Rasika. So okay. in 2018 at Congress Square in Ljubljana, Slovenia, I joined the activist choirs Borke in performing the song Precarious Blues, an adaptation of Maple Travis 16 Tones first recorded in 1946. While the original lyrics, lyrics illustrate a coal miner's life in the Kentucky mines, Zborke's version, written by its conductor Pia, portrays the perspective of a woman worker with a precarious job, including 16-hour work day and a lack of social support, such as paid maternity leave and abortion rights. The lyrics refer to the benefits of socialism, which encompass public pensions, free education, health care, and social protections for employees, including a year of fully paid maternity leave, paid meals, travel expenses, and so on. As the lyrics said, as you couldn't, of course, know because it's in Slovenian, nowadays these have been not just largely unavailable to workers in a state of precarity, but also gradually vanishing from national employment regulations in the post Yugoslav societies. In our version, the original refrain, you load 60 tons and what do you get? Another day older and deeper in debt, were exchanged with, you work 16 hours and what you get? You do not have money for burek, cheese uh, pie, and you also have no time. The lyrics continue. I do not know who invented this world order. I do not accept it. Let's resist. The lyrics also further suggest that not taking a vacation, not having a lunch break or a pension, which were previously forms of guaranteed state social protection, are now an individual responsibility, or as lyrics says, our problem. Referring to no money and no time as conditions of post-socialist life, the song depicts an exhausted, exploited subject whose struggle to satisfy basic human needs leaves no time for rest and leisure, but ends in complete uh, physical and emotional exhaustion, to quote lyrics, from the stressful job you get sick with a month of psychiatric leave, but your sick leave is not paid and your had, had, uh, health insurance isn't, ni isn't neither. So the precarious blues were autobiographical for many of us singing in certain aspects and certainly resonated also with the protest crowd who enthusiastically, as you also saw, supported us by clapping and nodding to express agreement. 
So to extend to which the song captured the overlapping exhaustions of different aspects of post-socialist life came to the fore some, month, some months later in my conversation with Tanya, a member of another post-Yugoslav activist choir Praxa from Pula, Croatia. After their performance in Ljubljana, we were discussing how deeply post-socialist devastation had, accepted, had affected all spheres of our lives, where she said with trembling in her voice, quote, the world we knew collapsed and it does not exist anymore. People are underpaid, exploited and tired, end of quote. This statement resonated with me very strongly as I found it described not only the overall contemporary experience of life in post-socialist region, but more general under neoliberalism. And also, this is also what basically I would like to discuss and focus in my talk. So the dissolution of social forms of life as a part of the general dissolution of the socialist project of structural or class equality. So just to give some historical context to how I connect and why I connect these social forms of life with structural equality, which was uh, promised uh, by the socialist project. Uh, so after the dissolution of socialist Yugoslavia, which dissoluted in 1991 and was founded in 1945, uh, and ethnic wars, which also occurred in this region in the 90s, the region experienced the profound economic, social, and political transformation, what was in the Western liberal discourses identified as post identified as post socialist transition to capitalism and democracy. In practice, the desert of post-socialism, as some colleagues, post-Yugoslav scholars call it, or post-socialist disaster capitalism, proved to be an experience of economic dispossession and privatization that resulted in the devastation of, to quote Gal Kirm, the resources, infrastructure, wealth, and people accumulated and born in socialism, end quote. Ruling mantra of foreign investments as the main source of the country's economic survival prevailed post socialist social, political, and cultural life through weakening state institutions, corruption, clientelism, and so on. But we often also hear in these protests, and this protest was uh, again related to all these problems of, uh, of post socialist, post Yugoslav societies. So scholars of post-socialism criticize the rhetoric of transition that is often presented as an abrupt temporal switch that reduces the complex transformation to the economic process. So Yugoslavia, others also said that uh, this term dismissed ironically the situation that capitalism was extremely easy and successfully introduced. So that was not along some kind of a process of transition. And that this uh, making this term to lose actually its meaning. So these critiques in general contest the idea of the clear path from socialist totalitarian past to European democratic future and problem problematize the capitals dem capitalism democracy continuum which instead of liberation, democratization, and progress resulted in devastation, impoverishment, and exhaustion. A distinct experience of post-socialism and global capitalism that reveals current post-social political conjunctures in its messy, uncertain, and ambiguous reality in the region, I believe resonates not just in the region and about the region, but also across the globe about devastating consequences of neoliberalism and its crisis. So I hope that in this talk, I will offer a glimpse into these realities with the focus on expressive practices, in my case, collective singing, and the way of recuperating and imagining, imagining previous uh, revolutionary socialist projects with all it, uh, their incapacities and ambiguities in the current, current moment. So uh, my long-term research, uh, which is basically now almost more than 10 years uh, with singing collectives, which call themselves um, self-organized or activist choirs, Basically, uh, members using these terms, trying to play with this traditional idea and the concept of choir and chorus. So they use terms such as self-organized choirs, alternative choirs, partisan choirs, punk choirs, even choral band or choral collective. So that indicates the specific organizational structure, the one they actually cult uh, cultivates open participation, self-organization and consensus-based social relations. 
So in that sense, this uh, and just to give some more information about the choirs, and we can discuss more in Q&A, of course, if you need more, more context. These choirs started to be founded after 2000 and even more intensively after 2008 and global economic crisis is in almost all bigger cities of former Yugoslav Republic. So in Belgrade, Zagreb, Skopje, Pula, and also in Vienna, uh, Austria. <clears throat> So I, I was following the activities of the choirs from 2011 until, until today. So uh, in, this, in, in the recent literature, uh, these forms of social organizing are usually identified as, for example, do it yourself. So cultural activities based on the principles of participation, bottom-up initiatives, alternative knowledge productions, they promulgate uh, anti-commercial and anti-capitalist uh, ethics. So, and uh, certainly as a collective activities, the people engage uh, regardless of their musical skills or knowledge. And this is also important when we talk about open participation, this actually means that these people are joining the choir without any musical skill, any knowledge, uh, and basically uh, strive for cooperative ethos. And definitely in that sense, these choirs can easily fall into this label. However, today I would like to, uh, uh, say that this concept and this conceptual framework fails to capture the ways in which singing activism is informed by the specific historical legacies and actually may fail to recognize the legacy of class-based perspectives, political economy, social, uh, socialist infrastructure, including cultural infrastructure, uh, relationship between uh, labor and leisure and so on. So in that sense, as Rasik also opened uh, uh, today's talk and in general out our talks, uh, I think the, the conceptual vocabulary I decided to use today and the, the frame, analytical framework I um, used to analyze this choir in my research also uh, not, uh, not, uh, does not try somehow to introduce uh, and to use uh, concepts which are globally circulating now, but actually try to reclaim some specific historical knowledge and experiences. So I think it's for me, it's very important to, to uh, understand uh, how these choirs somehow are important in bringing uh, some repressed or neglected knowledge of the former second world or the former socialist, uh, socialist societies. So um, I also see uh, the importance uh, to what I would suggest today amateurism or what I would even more suggest strategic amateurism as important to discuss in the context in which uh, radical uh, progressive changes uh, brought about neoliberalism in uh, former Yugoslavia resulted not just in transformation of labor patterns, but also in other spheres of social life, uh, and as I said, dissolution of, of social, social ties. So in that sense, uh, uh, I would like to say that neoliberal economic reforms based on privatization and dispossessions resulted not just what, heard, what we heard in these uh, lyrics, low wages, economic insecurity, precarization, forcing people or over exploitation to, to work much more than eight hours per day, uh, leaving no time for rest, no time for leisure, but also as the song made evident the loss of uh, way of life. So demonstrating that privatization is a broader and complex process, not limited just to economic or political sphere, but actually affected both productive and non-productive spheres of our lives. And in that sense, uh, I think uh, singing and any kind of expressing and aesthetic activity also radically changed. So our approach to any of these communal activities uh, which are done in a free leisure time also radically change after socialism. And I, I would like to take these choirs as an laboratories for this, to see how this and why this happens and how we can deal and how, what we can learn from it. So um, this reconfiguration uh, that actually was fostered by, by introducing, introducing of neoliberalism in the post-Yugoslav context also uh, change these, uh, for me today, important part of paid, non-paid activities, productive, non-productive -productive time. So just to, again, back to history. 
So Yugoslavia was founded in 1945, uh, and it's very important after the uh, resistance of from the resistance in the Second World War. Uh, that was uh, Yugoslav partisans. We can discuss about the history and uh, contested aspects of this history. But from 1945, actually, Yugoslavia was a socialist country, which which shared similarities, but also showed significant differences from other Eastern European state socialist countries. After abandoning the Soviet model in 1948, so the primary features of Yugoslav socialism were worker self-management and non-aligned orientation in the Cold War world divide. So not being a part of Eastern Bloc, but instead the founder of non-alignment movements, Socialist Yugoslavia actually optimized something which is called socialism with a human face or third way of socialism, third path to socialism. Basically, the idea of decentralized worker self-management and the economy of social ownership. I think this is important because when we think about socialism, we usually uh, try to think about some state ownership, the idea of Cold War uh, division, and so on. So it's important to, to uh, emphasize these peculiarities of uh, Yugoslav socialism. So this means that uh, economic system uh, was, or how it was often called Yugoslav experiment, was based on fostering worker self-management as participatory cooperative model of political and economic power distribution. Uh, there are many other uh, research on these, on the controversies of worker self-management, what happened with this idea of de-ethetization uh, and the idea of self-management as a way toward communism uh, so and the self-governance in that way. But what I'm interested in as a, as a scholar uh, interested in artistic and cultural field, for me, it was very important that during socialism, the self-management was also not happening just in the sphere of, of labor, but it was very important that how self-managed culture was an important part of building new society, new socialist society. So establishing on a broad uh, cultural infrastructure of cultural houses, cultural centers, public theaters, orchestras, music schools, libraries, and so on, the idea of self-managed culture was to simulate working people. So the idea of working people to engage in cultural, artistic, and other, other activities. So the so-called cultural system was very, very important that include physical infrastructure, as I said, cultural institutions, societies, but also in a sense of networking of people of different types, providing support for leisure activities in the cultural, educational, aesthetic films, uh, fields. For example, from folk culture to experimental arts, film, music, theater, radio, visual art, and so on. So in the center of self-managed, uh, managed, the idea of self-managed uh, managed culture was the discourse and practices of amateurism. Uh, which was very important in the way of reclaiming the culture from below as a corrective to professionalized culture. Uh, so the amateur, the position of amateur was uh, at the core of the idea of structural transformation in which people who actually participated in the cultural activities were given an active role in building a new system. So uh, amateurism in this context carrying a strong class dimension and propose active, active participation in cultural activities of all people, regardless, regardless of their social background of level education. So, um, for example, regarding class consciousness through amateur music activities, Dragotin Cvetko write, uh, quote, uh, writes, all those who have talent or who have been willing to learn basic musical skills who, but who before war, Second World War, were deprived of educational performative opportunities, could develop and implement their talent during the socialist revolution and after. So to end quote. So uh, in that sense, the idea of amateurism was very important as shaping new idea of culture also revolutionizing the position of cultural sphere in the whole social structure. So the idea of culture no, is, was not to be some kind of an addition to, to social structure or social political structure, but it was basically putting in a, in a key of emancipation 
of revolutionary subject and then later on socialist working people. So, uh, of course, we can discuss about contradictions and failures of how to promote this cultural expression of amateurism of all working people in, in practice. But the key for me also today and in my research is how amateurism was actually uh, positioned as some kind of a position of the bourgeois understanding of culture, which instead of uh, emphasizing some uh, class position or, or uh, making a uh, working uh, class subject as at the center of this amateurism actually supported uh, structural equality. So not working class as we usually understand in the Western discourses, but actually it was open category for practicing uh, structural equality in this, in which way. So uh, there were these cultural houses, this uh, huge network of cultural artistic um, centers, uh, cultural centers, artistic centers were open for everyone. So regardless if these people are uh, educated, not educated, just simply interested in some activity, some activity or no. So this conceptual uh, importance of amateurism uh, was important in a sense of uh, care from, or for cultural expression and, and usage of the non-productive of leisure time. So, for example, Rudy Supek, Yugoslav sociologist, elaborates to quote, free time should create a need for some activities that are actually reaction to working hours and work activities. Namely, work activities have become so mechanized, stereotypical, routinized, which produces a need for something that will compensate for these activities and make a person feel more complete, end of quote. So from these, uh, let's say, uh, possibilities and structures for having leisure, cultural leisure time as an addition to productive uh, waged labor. After the dissolution of Yugoslavia, the cultural politics in the new nation states turned to from these rhetorics to the rhetorics of cultural and entertainment industry that promoted the figure of a free consumer of cultural products that would actually substitute the supposedly repressive socialist culture, cultural politics and limited offer, which is uh, very interesting because although the sphere of le uh, labor was of course uh, very often um, privileged in, uh, in the discourses, in analysis, the field of culture was somehow not so uh, prominent when we discuss uh, class equality, when we discuss struggle also for labor rights. But on the other hand, when socialism was proclaimed to be a totalitarian regime, leisure was a very important aspect. So it was always the way, the part of life where it was assumed that socialist state imposed um, their own uh, kind of uh, repressive politics. So it was not that labor was uh, that key part of repressive politics of socialist state, but actually it was this part that how socialist people during socialism were actually in their private life and in an intimate life and then leisure life were actually under the repression of socialist state. So it was very interesting how in these narratives, narratives coming from the critique of socialism as totalitarian paradigm, totalita as totalitarian regime actually targeted these, these aspects of free time, leisure, are free, where, where uh, liberal understanding of free subjects should be somehow produced. So after the end of socialism, uh, it was not just that this turn to entertainment and cultural industries somehow promoted this figure of consumers and consumerism was basically a uh, very important part of, um, of official discourses and also of the discourse of freedom and democratization. Now we are free, we can, we can buy we, what, can, uh, what we want and so on. It's very important that um, the cultural institution, the placing of culture was also at the margins of national poli uh, political priorities, which, was, uh, which consequently also radically changed the relationship between paid and unpaid labor and the way how the concept between these two and dynamics with these two between these two were reconstituted. So the turn to market 
has changed the status, for example, of previously non-monetized, free time, volunteer leisure practices, and socially owned infrastructure, like cultural houses, cultural centers, or other institutional networks, which either disappeared or were privatized or, or uh, were simply waiting for, for being ruined, totally abandoned. And uh, I was very um, eager to follow choirs and to, uh, to sing with choirs when they defend some of the socialist infrastructure, like, like cinemas, which were privatized by some tycoons uh, who ended up in, in jail, but trying to somehow uh, keep this infrastructure from total ruination. So um, on the other hand, some of these uh, cultural centers, some of these aspects of culture became important commodities in the new economy. So um, in that sense, neoliberal reforms actually brought uh, commodification of the overall uh, spheres of lives, but also this misbalance between productive and not, not productive time, which really resulted in complete dismissal of le leisure that was realized only as, uh, to be realized only as non-monetized or vol voluntary activities. So the dominant discourses of neoliberal regimes also brought about the focus on productivity, competition, and in that sense, non-productive time was also not just minimalized, but trivialized. So non-productive time was pushed at the margins of value and uh, relevance, and very often left to, to be guided uh, by the flows of capital. So in that sense, this dynamic between paid, unpaid labor, I mean productive and non-productive labor in the field of everyday culture and artistic activities is, uh, was uh, radically also changed if we discuss post-socialist privatization. So to return to my, my discussion and to the role of choir and choirs and aesthetics and expressive practices, particularly the collective participatory, um, open participatory approach. I think it opens the question of what and how to do with this free or product of time beyond labor, uh, la uh, labor. And how due to also the fact that less and less possible was and is for people in the post-socialist countries is to be organized to labor. And we, also follow the more general discourses about labor weakness than uh, impossibility of people, not just unionized, but also in the post-socialist uh, uh, countries, the very sense of agency of workers, the very sense of structural agency that you, you can really be subject of any transformation, but you're just object of all transformations that happen to you. So it's about not just the dissolution of infrastructure, but, uh, or, 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 or um, let's say unionization, making networks, alliances, solidarities, but the very idea that you can be any kind of subject in any kind of transformation. So in that way, uh, I was interested in my own research on the activities of activist self-organized choirs, how, whether these activities may open a space for some kind of a care for leisure and how singing in these collectives help, help, can help people to live, to persist, to resist these different exhaustions, devastations of, of life, of uh, material, as I said, infrastructure, but also social infrastructure. So I was, um, I started thinking if how we can, uh, how these choirs, if they can be a laboratory for possibilities and impossibilities of escape from neoliberal devastation if, and to take time uh, for our, yourself or as Marina Grzinic and uh, uh, Refik Tatlic say, take time for ourselves with others. So um, in that sense, how in the, in the situation, not just in post-socialist, but in general, globally, neoliberalism is if it's understood as a technology of managing and administrating our social lives through a system of calculation, how basically people can steal their life or steal parts of their life from the, these uh, system of neoliberal calculation. Um, these uh, questions of course are huge and I, I uh, face with several uh, limits and choir members themselves also are, are constantly facing with many, many limits. But, 
this is, I think, where this category of amateurism, as it was envisioned and it was conceptualized during socialism uh, in socialist Yugoslavia, can, for me, in my, uh, believe, my opinion, serve as a kind of a productive, uh, productive space, productive category not just category, but also historical knowledge and historical experience, uh, as I would say, missing knowledge and experience. Because especially if we discuss amateurism in a field, for example, of music or cultural activities, what we usually get is either folk-oriented approach to cultural amateurism, so different kind of a, uh, folk music and dances, particularly in Central Eastern Europe, or church choirs, or any kind of, particularly in the Western liberal discourses, community choirs, community music, community singing, which somehow, either in the sense of Central Eastern Europe, amateurism was used as a way of building, na nation building, usually, so the way of social cohesion on one sense, or the other sense, community music, community singing paradigm, which was used as a music from below something which would stay uh, in the relationship of bottom up, top down. But I think the category of amateurism of, as it was conceptualized in Yugoslav socialism, invites some kind of a structural approach. So structural agency, uh, which does not easily go in this top down uh, um, and bottom up perspective. So, I believe that it can be a way of critical engagement with the capitalist commodification, alienation, and exploitation. And, uh, and I, would interest, I, I am interested in the ways in which activist singers' engagement with this position of an amateur serve as a counter response to this uh, reality, current reality uh, in post-socialist context based on professionalization through industries as a key to alienation, fragmentation, and exhaustion which was actually brought about by the neoliberal corporate state. So if socialist amateurism is involved in the reshaping, reshaping of social relations and the collective subjectivity making as socialist discourses suggested, how does recalling its historical sensibility intervene in the contemporary context marked by the exhaustion, as I said, work leisure misbalances, precarity, self-exploitation, and in general, life based on commodification. So, uh, and we couldn't simply make this a translation of particular historical moments into contemporality. So just to see, okay, this choir's seeing some repertoire. We, we heard some of the repertoire, but they also sing partisan song, revolutionary songs, workers' songs, so the whole repertoire associated with the, for example, anti-fascist struggles uh, of and socialist revolution from the Second World War. They sing many of the global left repertoire and so on, but still through repo, uh, recuperating the repertoire or ethos and language of cl class struggle. So activists have to deal with the reality they live in. So, and not to be as they are sometimes very often um, uh, somehow labeled to be some hipsters, some people who are totally out of uh, any reality. So they perform and they invite some times which are basically in the past and cannot be returned here. So uh, in my interaction with the activist choirs, of course, they often say that they want to regain power of amateur singing as an alternative way of performing and listening to music under capitalism. So they avoid any paid commercial engagement. They, of course, perform and protest and they, have, they do flash mobs. They perform also on, at concerts, but they don't sing for money. They, they avoid singing for brand promotions, corporative events, and in generally opposed uh, the idea of uh, individualized commerce, uh, consumerist patterns but the, defend the importance of be together to make collectively uh, singing regardless of their own capacities on their own skills and, and, and knowledge. So in that sense, um, their activities stand as a response to the overall dismissal of uh, these collective structural ideas of making some leisure time, being in some leisure time together uh, and also subvert the idea of music as entertainment, which was, of course, one of the dominant uh, approach. So uh, 
the singers also, also often emphasize in our interaction that they do these things for love, which is also typical kind of a idea of amateur, which is also in the very uh, etymology of the term. But I often also encounter statements frame singing activism, as I said, to love, passion, dedication, that clearly somehow contrasted some experience of commodification, of uh, something which is done uh, for being pain, drained, routinized, and so on. So uh, such state statements of the singers and they, as well as their activities, evoke untrained and uneducated aesthetics uh, uh, and activities that in a certain way try to evoke this idea of self-made or self-managed subjects that uh, somehow stand in opposition to these, uh, the idea of expert of, or the professional. So singers often frame their involvement in collective non-pain, non-monetized activity as an important source of uh, energy satisfaction, but it's also important not to overlook the fact that for some of them, uh, the post-privatization labor, uh, labor regimes, which are actually based on these uh, flexibilization of labor so that you can choose entrepreneurial approach uh, to subject, actually sometimes uh, offer them a possibility to more easily be a member of the choir. So very often the fact that you don't have a fixed job from nine to five, or you don't have to work uh, more than 12 hours, help these people to be more uh, engaged in these leisure activities. So the question was, who then are the people who actually can think and mobilize amateurism as a way of structural uh, agency in the field of beyond, beyond labor? So uh, these, in that sense, can also help uh, these uh, work le leisure misbalances can help singers to engage more freely in the choir activities, giving them the uh, flexibility to organize their work day and to adjust to rehearsal and performances. For example, I quit singing in the job in, in these choirs, in this choir I, I played at the beginning because I simply couldn't, couldn't, I didn't have time for this. So although singers' economic background also different, most of these singers in the activist choirs either struggle to find the regular uh, employment and they are precarious workers, uh, uh, IT designers, architects, they are actually not manual or essential workers. So there are almost no taxi drivers, medical staff, or people who are really uh, belong to these uh, essential uh, uh, workers uh, in the choir. So it's very interesting that predominantly these are people who are, if they are freelance, they are copywriters, uh, filmmakers, intellectuals, and so on. So in that sense, we are still, uh, again, thinking about translation of certain historical sensibilities and inabilities and abilities to uh, put these things together. So for example, for those singers who have the opportunity for a regular salary, and they are usually employed in the public education sector, social work, which also grant them some level of flexibility. So the struggle against actually uh, capitalist exploitation and that, that labor leisure misbalances, if we look at the structure of the activist choirs, we can say that it largely remains in the hands of people who are not hit the most by the consequences of the post-privatization dev devastation. And they so still have some times and resources to what would they usually say, sacrifice for culture or sacrifice for cultural leisure. Because singers always said that it's not easy to do that. It's not easy to, to be an activist in singing, that you have to go to rehearsal, to ha you have to go to so many of these protests and this culture is always some kind of a sacrifice. So um, these possibilities of strategic afterlives, of this continuity of the socialist idea of self-managed managed culture or socialist amateurism is definitely limited by the conditions of the capitalist uh, uh, exploitation, labor, leisure, misbalances, and the uh, commodification of life. So in the state of exhaustion and apathy of 
subjects, people in, in the area of former Yugoslavia. It's uh, the very singing is also very often reported to be therapeutical, simply think. So if you are incapable of doing any systematic systemic transformation and you are incapable to really resist, uh, if you remember at the beginning, the song, let's say, who invented this world order, Re let's resist. But this resistance was basically limited to this line because resistances didn't really somehow uh, echoed very often beyond the very setting of the performance. So at the end, singers often reported how these mobilization of ethos of amateurism, of this idea of being uh, making some collective leisure, uh, cultural leisure time, is actually important uh, benefit for them to simply survive, to simply uh, uh, sustain their the life and then energy. Many of them, of course, valued somatic art of singing, the physical energy of singing, emotional, affective potential as really the most important feature of the singing. So that, that the idea that we can um, uh, physically embodied be together and that affective actualization through the body was also works as a remedy for social fragmentation and alienation also as a dominant form of life for them. So um, shall we then understand their activities as a cruel optimism, as Lorraine Berlan said, as an attachment to the compromised conditions of possibility. So we are doing something, we, although we know that we cannot or that simply helps them to navigate and helped us to navigate exhaustion of living in a post-privatization condition. I would say uh, definitely that singing activism helps in understanding how collective expressive activity allows, allows people to live, to, to live, to negotiate, to resist, uh, and somehow as a remedy to this vulnerability, exhaustion brought about neoliberalism. But I would say that in the post-socialist context also direct, directs attention to an important uh, relationship between labor and leisure. Uh, so uh, recently uh, we, can, we can hear uh, discourses and kind of a call for taking leisure back. So there are several publications about um, return of amateur, um, how leisure is important. So for example, Srnicek and Williams are particularly uh, um, starting the, uh, from the assumption that under capitalism, jobs are not a source of income, but are also uh, key to our social lives and a sense of ourself. So the, the, let's say the behind all these quests for more leisure for, for uh, also the, the amateur, for the life which goes beyond these dominance of work uh, and meaning of life beyond work uh, are part of this post work imaginary. So there's, there are some huge scholarly production in the last, I don't know, 10, 15, maybe even more, I'm not aware of everything, maybe 20 years. Uh, where, um, for example, to, to quote Sinichek and Williams uh, about uh, meaningful, meaningful life beyond work as an alternative to production of subjectivity in, in neoliberalism, they said, leisure should not be confused with illness as many of things we enjoyed most involve immense amounts of effort. So they propose that what should, should be free is to practice activities such as learning musical instrument, reading, playing sports, socializing with friends. So these are now offered as something which is uh, important to challenge uh, neoliberal uh, production of, of life. Um, and Maurizio Lazarato further claims that all human beings should be artists as a challenge to capitalist accommodation because capitalist accommodation does not uh, work any longer from uh, exploitation of labor, but also exploitation of knowledge, life, health, leisure, culture. So um, Oli Mould, for example, uh, emphasize 
that work-like like practices invade our leisure time. Uh, of course, Cathy Weeks also searches for a conceptual framework that can embrace forms of social cooperation, which are, I quote her, less readily transformed into new forms of work and thus less easily recooperated with, with the present terms of the work society. So these authors contest the general privileging of labor and reclaim leisure as available concept to understand and fight the neoliberal um, production of, of a subject. Uh, draw, of course, drawing on, on these views. However, I think that the post-socialist uh, experience and also based on my uh, case study of activist choirs revealed a need for a third way of thinking the one that definitely embraces the specificities of a post-socialist context and theorize leisure in, in this historical conceptuality, but does not simply go for searching uh, political value and social value in leisure instead of le labor. So uh, I think the legacy for state socialism actually uh, offered the perspective that privileged cultural leisure as a main site of communal form of life, which are based on a structural transformation and envision not just an additional sphere beyond labor, but as a main vehicle of the structural transformation of both the productive and non-productive spheres of life. So trying to see how leisure and labor are definitely part of, cannot be uh, separated in this struggle. So this perspective proposes looking at the struggles in the field of leisure as being of the crucial importance for discussing the material conditions of life, including meaningful wage labor. So in contrast to post-work imaginaries that largely invest the potential to resist ref refusal of work, emphasizing leisure activities reminds us that reclaiming both cultural leisure and labor beyond surplus value is a key to fighting this exhaustion. So amateurism or strategic amateurism in the case of, of these choirs indicates the lack of importance uh, of structural systemic care for leisure that was once constitutive uh, field of emancipatory uh, emancipation during socialism. And uh, Taking strategically this position and experimenting can be actually an important in uh, recalling the historical moment where these amateur activities were an essential part of overall systemic change. So the overall systemic change of socialist revolution and, uh, and towards socialist state. So um, in that sense, uh, it's important uh, that um, the labor leisure uh, relationship is actually key instead of uh, imagining some time, uh, so, some non productive time or refusal of work, which is basically not possible for many people living in the post socialist countries. They have to persist in, in uh, continue working. Uh, going back to, to structural, that basic infrastructural of care was not some kind of individualized actions, but that structural care for leisure, a structural care for cultural leisure was a key to, to socialist uh, uh, emancipation and the way how actually the socialist subject was, was um, envisioned. So in that sense, uh, the idea of amateurism recall this infrastructural systemic care in contrast to current moment in the post-socialist context where basically people are left to struggle alone with this social fragmentation ex exhaustion uh, imposed by the post-socialist transformations. So uh, the idea of emancipatory idea of cultural leisure for everyone somehow invo invokes these, these uh, uh, on one sense, important aspects of uh, 
what we have to actually learn from the past, but also expose impossibilities to embrace these structural agency today. So I would I would simply end in this and then open open the floor for for discussion and for questions.